All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Massimo, AKA Max. Um, I work at Connext and I'm from Milan, so I'm very, very excited to be here. Can you hear me all right? Fantastic. Um, so Connext is a piece of infrastructure for Web3. We are actually a bridging protocol that allows you to move tokens and data uh, across multiple chains in a very, very secure way. And Marone Connects is everything that doesn't involve engineering and technical development. So I change my head every day from marketing to business development to growth of the ecosystem. Um, so I thought that today we could uh, explore a little bit um, what is the idea, wh wh why are we doing all this, right? Wh why are we here today? Um, where is this idea of Web3 coming from and where are we headed somehow? And I like to start from this quote that was originally crafted for Bitcoin, but I think it resonates very well with what we're trying to do with Web3, as Web3 wasn't created actually to make you rich, but to really make you free. Um, free from what? Uh, free from third parties in general. Free from authorities that are able to extract value uh, from your activities, from your data, from your money, from your identity. And uh, we think it's not fair. We think there should be a fairer web, a fairer way of doing things, and that's what Web3 is about. Um, it is really a convergence of different multiple trends, where the original idea of the internet that started in the, in the 90s um, was really based on some decentralized and community-governed protocols and communities uh, that you know, generated the first wave of innovation with websites and um, uh, access to enabling people to access information uh, on multiple, uh, you know, uh, from around the globe. Um, and, but the issue is that it was a very passive way of accessing this information. So you could read data, you could read websites, uh, but there was no way for normal users to contribute. So this is what happens with the second wave of the web, uh, called normally the web two, uh, where you know, a bent of social media platforms come and say, hey, you user can not only read information, but you can also contribute, you can write. Um, unfortunately, what happened on infrastructure level is that we see a concentration of power at this point, because these platforms from Facebook, from Twitter, from you know, LinkedIn, you mentioned, you name it, um, are now able to concentrate the power and therefore extract value from uh, the activities that users are producing for, from their data. Um, and so this Web3 is now a, a new wave of innovation that tries to re-empower again users and builders and creators um, for what they actually deserve, right? They, they produce the, the content, they produce information, they produce data, they own the data. Um, so they should be empowered to actually own and control and be rewarded for this system. Um, so this whole idea is really the convergence of multiple trends, multiple stuff, um, and the Web3 system is already becoming extremely complex and way too big for me to describe it in 20 minutes. But I wanted to stop on just a few key points, key milestones that I think are important to understand, again, the values that brought us here and what we can do with them. Um, so the first, you know, one of these trends is definitely coming from the idea of we should own our money, we should own our assets. Um, and so we see, in the, we've seen in the past 30, 40 years, a lot of experimentations in this sense uh, with uh, early projects around cryptography and um, the idea of how can you really become the true owner of money or digital cash that ultimately, of course, c culminate into Bitcoin. Uh, but the idea, you know, the, the principle behind it was that we didn't want anybody to trust a third party, a third party that can control your value, control your money, can extract value out of it. And so they invented these systems to really reduce the trust that you were acquiring to, into another party uh, that ultimately led to the, you know, a, a decentralized system. So if nobody has control, we give control to anybody. Uh, so nobody, there's no actual third party, whether it's a government, it's a bank, that can control what you can do with your assets. Um, this then evolved into the idea of, okay, it's not only assets, it's not only money, but it's also your identity, it's also your data. Um, and as we said, the, the idea of breaking up these silos, these ecosystems that were um, created in the past, um, because they, were they are actually limiting innovation. They are trying to extract value from what you own, from what you do. 
So then we come to, you know, 2014, um, probably in my opinion, one of the you know, biggest innovations in the history of humankind uh, with the birth, birth of uh, Ethereum, which is this platform that allows you to create um, programs that needs to be executed on this transparent system, on this trustless system, um, and ultimately, ultimately allows you to create assets that are programmable and composable together. And from this point on, we see the first kind of product market feed of some use cases, you know, from stable coins, the centralized stable coins like MakerDAO and, and DAI, uh, the first exchanges on, on chain, uh, the first lending platforms that allow you to um, yeah, get a yield out of uh, the stable assets that, um, uh, or, or leverage actually, uh, apply leverage to uh, you know, your bet. Uh, then NFTs and DAOs and so on. So all these ecosystems, all these um, kind of key components of the um, of the Web3 uh, that for me are limited if they are considered by themselves. I think the real key features of blockchains is the ability to compose these dis different elements together. Um, this composability really gives you some um, like some extra powers that you don't normally have during Web2. Uh, this powers allows you to really create utility when you combine these protocols together. Um, that wasn't possible before. And um, this, this, this new utility creates the ultimate competitive advantage because you become kind of interlaced with other, other projects, other protocols. Um, and then when this project grows, you also grow. So you also, your success is also your partner's success. And it truly becomes a permissionless open system where everybody is free to come, join, participate, and, and create something better, something, something, um, something new. Um, what this, uh, you know, ultimately, um, what's the ultimate outcome is exponential growth which is what we're starting to see from the 2020. This is the value that's been locked into this system, these ecosystems um, from, the 20, you know, from, the, from the beginning, but then really we saw a, a, a kind of exponential growth from the 2020 when people realized how to combine these different elements together, how to incentivize them properly, and, and so on. Um, last year, so we, you know, just you know, coming to a, a recap of, of the last years, um, what we saw in the last years was that we, we really reached a point on the infrastructure level where you know, the basic concept of a blockchain co couldn't scale up anymore. So we started to see tentatives from users and from builders to actually scale these ecosystems um, to make them more accessible, more cheap, more faster for, for the everyday users. And scalability on the blockchain can be done in two ways. One is vertical, so it, that's the Ethereum and layer two um, approach. Uh, where you know you build something on top of another infrastructure, or horizontal scalability when you actually create a parallel ecosystem uh, that you know can um, al allows you to actually you know bring resources uh, somewhere else, so you don't kind of don't get the original one clogged anymore. And so this is the reality today. This is where we are. Uh, this is a snapshot taken from DeFi Lama Yama on uh, the first of May. It's hard to deny today that we don't live in a multi-chain world. Um, Ethereum still is the dominant player with 50% of the value locked across all the ecosystems. But you know, we see a lot of other new ecosystems coming up and many, many more are coming up. Um, what's the issue with that? Is that we really started this whole thing by saying, okay, we want to break up silos, you know, right? we want to have this unified ecosystem that goes, that is permissionless and open and accessible to everyone. And now we're back to silos again, right? We have these different chains, we have these different domains that are, exist with each other. They are secure by themselves, but they're not connected with each other. If you think about the biggest protocols that exist today, Curve, Aave, uh, Uniswap, the friends with Balancer before, uh, they, they are deployed on multiple chains, but this, this, these interfaces, these um, instances are totally isolated from each other. They don't communicate with each other. So we are back to silos again. We are in a multi-chain world, but we are not in a cross-chain world. And so we need this, this cross-chain um, this cross uh, you know, capability to bring back the idea of composability again, which we saw it was the really key feature of the blockchain, right? Composability, the idea of combining these different apps, combining these different elements together. Uh, 
uh, rather than keeping them isolated. So we need bridges. That's why Connect exists. Uh, we need these interoperability protocols. Uh, but but there is always a but, as everything in life. Uh, not all the bridges are the same. So for a bridge to really be an effective part of the infrastructure of Web3, it needs to, be, it needs to have two major characteristics. Right? It needs to, of course, be able to bring any type of message from different chains. But most of everything, it needs to be very secure and it needs to be extensible to, onto every, um, into various ecosystems. Right? If you are limited to one ecosystem, then you're not really a universal bridge. Uh, this is what is happening today. So we have some uh, what we call native bridges that are very secure, but are actually very limited to specific domains. And this is the case, for example, of the optimistic rollups. For example, they are actually a bridge between Ethereum and you know the the, the layer two, but they are, which are is super secure, super uh, you know effective in what they do. But they are only limited to their own ecosystem, right? They cannot communicate with the other parts. Same thing happened for the other uh, all, all the layer twos or the Cosmos ecosystem. If you're familiar with that, uh, it's a very secure system, but it's kind of enclosed by itself. So they are all isolated with each other. Um, then there are other type of bridges, which unfortunately are the majority of bridges, um, where they actually created a third party that has the task of monitoring what happens on one chain and then saying, okay, this happened on one chain, I can actually move the inform bring information onto the other chain. Um, normally it's a set of validators, sometimes it's a multi-sig, sometimes in worst cases it's just an oracle. Um, the point is that you now have a third party that is responsible for bringing the messages from one chain to another one. And if you recall at the beginning, third parties was exactly the, <laughs> the problem that we wanted to avoid. Right? We wanted to avoid having a third party because that's uh, subjectable to being hacked, to being bribed, to, being, to make mistakes, and all these type of issues that we wanted to avoid at the beginning. Again, we are back at the start. So how do we connect these uh, separated ecosystems uh, in a way that is secure, that is extensible, and is totally trustless for, uh, for users of protocols? Um, this sound, it might sound a little bit right, too, too much, like why, why do we need to care about security that much? Um, the point is, if the system, if the whole infrastructure is not able to resist an attack and interference from a you know, small government, a big corporation, somebody who has money, uh, then why are we doing all this? Right? Why we did all this 30 years of research or 30 years of effort if somebody can count a few millions and say, hey, I actually want to screw up this system. So we need to have resilient systems. Um, security is your responsibility, of course, as a builder in particular. I will never stress this out. Like if you build on unsafe projects and then those protocols mess it up, then it's your fault. So <laughs> you, should, you should be the first one responsible for your community to build on resilient systems. So let me introduce you finally, Connect and Nomad. Um, we are a uh, stack, we have built a stack together. Um, that allows you to bring messaging so, uh, from one chain to another one in a very, very trust-minimized way. The way it works is that um, Nomad is the basic um, layer, let's say, uh, of the communication protocol. Um, the Nomad guys say, okay, it's really impossible to say that, uh, for, to say from one chain that something happened on another chain because the two systems are isolated by definition. But what we can do, we can say, we can actually prove if something didn't happen on another chain. So what Nomad allows you to do is to bring a message from one domain to another one. But before the message becomes valid, there is a 30 minute latency period. And during this period, anybody, any watcher can come and say, hey, the message, the message that you brought here is not correct. It's actually is a mistake. There was a fraud. So if there is one good actor in the ecosystem, we are able to prevent to keep the system secure. Okay. So what um, this you know it's called a, an optimistic approach. It's very similar to the optimistic rollups. Uh, we assume that there is always one good actor in the ecosystem, but this allows us to really bring any message to any chain uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Now, 30 minutes might be uh, not, not be, you know, that much, but it's way too much for users. <laughs> so um, that's where Connex comes in. Connex is a liquidity network. 
where basically there are some liquidity providers that say, hey user, you don't have to wait for 30 minutes for the message to come through, for the tokens to go from one chain to another one. We will, we will give them to you in advance and then we'll take them, uh, the ones that are coming um, in a slower way uh, 30 minutes after. So they, we front run basically the transactions, we give you the cash in advance and then we'll take the, um, uh, the tokens when they arrive in a slower way through Nomad. This is a good recap, I hope. Um, so we really need systems that are trustless and extensible onto any type of chains. Uh, and the reality is that there is only one solution today and that's the collaboration between Nomad and Connext. So we're very excited about it. Um, again, it's your responsibility to choose the secure systems. I, I cannot do anything apart from uh, you know, explaining what the differences are but then it will be your choice to make sure that your community, your users are actually secure and protected. Um, so we, you know, we established this way to actually create easy, uh, cheap and fast ways to transfer data. But what's really exciting is the next level. So it's not only a bridge that you can create with Connects and Nomad. Bridges are really just the beginning. What you can do is to create cross-chain applications. So applications that are natively um, operating on multiple chains without having to deploy on multiple chains. Some examples, you can create a cross-chain DEX, so an exchange where you send any tokens from any chains and you receive, you receive any other token from any chains because there is a communication protocol in the, in the middle that will uh, uh, you know, allow you to bridge the tokens onto the receiving chain. You can create cross-chain lending applications where you deposit ETH, for example, on Ethereum and then you borrow Matic on Polygon on a very trust-minimized way. Uh, you can create cross-chain governance, sending instructions from your DAO onto another chain and change the parameter on a specific contract, for example. Um, you can wrap NFTs and bring them onto another chain, fractionalize them and really democratize the process to have them access onto uh, cheaper chains. Um, and ultimately, you can really create, uh, select a chain as a central hub and avoid having to deploy onto any other chain. Because what you can do, you can just send the extractions by Connext to another chain, uh, call a smart contract on the other chain, uh, get a call back, get a call data on that chain, bring that data back to the original chain and have an asynchronous call back on the, on, the, on the sending chain. So you don't really have to deploy anymore on, the, um, on different chains, you just send the extraction from your central hub. And I th we think that this is where the next wave of innovations is, is going to happen. Uh, this is where Web3 is evolving. Um, and uh, I really believe that this is really um, culminating the, let's say, the, the vision that the regional founders of the web had of really a, an internet that is able to tr move value in a very seamless way, in a secure way, and to really compose these uh, different pieces and uh, Lego money. Um, across the whole metaverse and every, every space that you can think of. Thank you, this was um, Connext. We have actually announced our token on 420. Uh, we are setting up a DAO. Uh, if you guys want to collaborate with us, there are tokens for you. Um, you can, whether you're a builder, whether you're a marketer, whether you're in business, you can just become part of the contributors program and get rewarded for it. Uh, we really, we are really trying to build something that is exciting and I hope you guys can join us in this journey. Woo! Thank you.